in terms of the talk, I mean, I don't know, about seven years ago, I kind of relocated to North Wales because I kind of come to a point in my life where that question mark was kind of hanging over me. And I don't know if you ever reached a point in your life where you think you didn't know, quite know what you're doing, but you kind of know there's something that you should be doing, but you're not quite sure what it was. Anyway, as Grant mentioned, I've worked in corporate branding for 25 odd years. Had a great time, worked in London, uh, worked in New York and worked in Amsterdam. But in all that time, I was never really settled. I always thought there was something more that I could do. And about seven years ago, I was offered a job over in Holland to take up a position there with a big agency network. And uh, the weekend before I was due to go over to Holland, my daughter and I spent the weekend in the cottage that I got in Bala, in North Wales. And uh, we were walking on the banks of the River Dee. And I said to her, what do you think of the idea of me going to live in Holland? And we talked about it many times before. And she thought it was a great idea. We'd spent lots of weekends over in Holland and it was a fantastic place. And she actually turned to me and said, I think it's a really pants idea, Daddy. And she was, what, 10 years old at the time. And I actually said to her, you're right, I think it's a pants idea as well. So anyway, later that day, I took her back to her mum's. As I mentioned, I was divorced many, many years ago. Took her back to where she was living in Wrexham. And then on the way back, I kind of thought, shouldn't I be doing something else? Couldn't I maybe live up in North Wales and kind of do something? And I don't know if you know Bala, but Bala is quite in the middle of nowhere. The co cottage that I've got is uh, just outside a village called Klandarval, which is really quite a remote place. I don't have running water, so we had to put a well in. We got electricity and luckily got broadband. Anyway, so I took Lily back to, um, to her mum's, and um, this is what I found on the, on the lounge table. Yeah, I didn't know. And the two figures were from Playmobil's fantastic little play thing that you do with kids. And we had a little farm and a fairy tale castle that Lily and I used to play with lots. And I found this. And I kind of, well, I started to cry. And I kind of thought, you know what? It's not about the money. It's not about the position in, in Amsterdam. It's about something else. And 20 minutes later, literally, I got a text from a friend of mine who lives in London. And he said that a good friend of ours, Roly, committed suicide on Saturday night. So anyway, and I'd asked for kind of some divine inspiration the week before, saying, what should I do about this thing in Holland? Anyway, on that Sunday night, I decided to actually stay up in North Wales, to turn this job down, to leave the stuff that I was doing in London, and, and to go and live up in North Wales in the middle of nowhere. And it was quite interesting, because I then sort of thought, well, okay, well, let's see how hard it is. Let's see how good I am at creating tools for people, of doing branding and marketing in the middle of nowhere. Let's work with some small businesses, forget the big PLCs. So I started this, what now is a 10 year journey, and I'm now, what, seven years in. At the end of the first week, I always wanted a dog, always. I know that um, Jess is down there, but always wanted a dog, and uh, wanted to uh, call him Bilbo. Uh, when I was a boy, we had a dog called him Gandalf. Obviously, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit was big in our family. That was Lily at the end of the first week, so I kind of achieved that one. And in the same time, a friend of mine, I was talking to her on the phone, and she said, have you read this amazing book by A.C. Grayling called The Meaning of Things? And I don't know if any of you have read this, but do. Write it down. Read this book. Incredible. All about the philosophy of life, different things that can change, your way of thinking, the way of doing things. So anyway, I was reading this book and kind of thinking, oh, this is really exciting. What could I kind of do? And for me, one of the most important words in my life has always been no. When I was very long, younger, when I was a lot younger, I was always told that I wasn't very good at kind of education and exams and everything else, and I wouldn't get many GCSEs, so I decided to get them all. Then I shouldn't really do A-level, so I then decided to do them and got them all. Shouldn't really go to college, so I decided to do that and then kind of get a degree. So I kind of always you know, used this word, no. And I didn't realize that a few years ago, I discovered that I was dyslexic, you know, kind of word blindness, but I've always had a love and a passion for words. It took me something like seven times um, to get my English language O-level. So I've always had this sort of uh, affinity with words and how you use them. So every time somebody says no to me, I kind of just spin it on its head and just, it just spurs me to kind of take on the impossible, the really stupid things that you shouldn't really do, like trying to live in the middle of nowhere and start an international branding agency in a place called Bala. So anyway, so I sort of thought, well, okay, let's give this all a go. Um, and as part of this kind of, I suppose, this journey, I did a lot of work with schools and colleges, so I go into schools and colleges and talk to young people about on to being an entrepreneur, what it means to be in business and kind of do all that good stuff. And one of the things that I always say to kids is that why don't we look at the magnificent 26, as I call our wonderful alphabet. And the amazing thing is that with that alphabet, you can make people laugh, you can make people cry, you can write some of those beautiful pieces of poetry or, or stories in the world. And the thing is, but we all get the same tools. 
And then you think of the, sa the same 10 numbers that we get as everybody else. So how is it that some people turn those numbers into amazing mathematicians or even to things like rockets and everything else? The same with the words. How is it that some people can do that? If you take, we only get the same 12 musical notes as well. So again, when I go and talk to kids, I said, look, you get the same tools as everybody else, but it defines how we use them. It defines what we kind of become. Anyway, as part of this kind of exercise when I go and talk to schools, and they usually hold a little kind of seminar or workshop for about an hour. One of the things that I ask young people, and I used to ask this of big businesses, what one word you'd use to describe yourself? And I don't know how many of you have ever used this or ever tried this. What one word did you use to describe yourself? Anyway, the first class that I went to in Wrexham, which was three, four years ago, it's a class of 20 to 30 people. And I said to this young lad, what one word did you use to describe yourself? And he looked at me and went, weirdo. I did the same, I laughed. And I went, yeah, great. And he said, no, I think I'm a weirdo. And I said to him, why? And he said, nobody likes me, I get bullied. He said, I just listen to weird stuff, music and whatever. I then went around the rest of the class, as I said, 20 to 30 kids, and about 15 to 20% of them said exactly the same thing, freak, weirdo, abnormal. And I kind of realized, why do we think of ourselves in that way? And these are kids like 13, 14 years old. Anyway, I don't know if you know, but anyway, as I mentioned, 15% of them think of themselves exactly like that, freaks, weirdos, mits, misfits, and everything else. Question, do you know what the biggest killer of teenagers is in the UK? Any idea? Somebody mentioned suicide. Absolutely right, suicide. So I then started to think that I'd been in the world of branding and creativity. Could I create tools to help people think about who they are and what they could actually do? I then did more research. Do you know that 60% of people, and this is a survey done by Gallup a number of years ago, 60% of people in the workplace are actually unhappy at work, disenfranchised, yeah? 40 million pounds is wasted through unhappy people at work in the UK. Now this is just in a day. You imagine what that means 365 days a year. And if you then look at things like anxiety and, and depression, it costs the UK economy 70 to 100 billion pounds a year just because of anxiety and depression. So I had all of this research and all this digging kind of thought, wow, that's a lot of money. It really is. And also a lot of anxiety. So I kind of went back to the beginning, kind of went back to children. And Matthew, who was on stage earlier, is what, two and a half years old. See that he's just full of life. Question, how many times does the average four-year-old laugh in a day? Well, research says it's about two to three hundred times a day. Roll that forward to all of us here. How many times does the average adult laugh in a day? It's about 12 to 15. So what the hell happens? You're this big, aren't you? Matthew size, laughing, running around, creating joy. And then you get to our age. And what happens? Everything gets very serious, doesn't it? Life kind of piles up on you. But the mad thing is, is that people say that when you go to school, you learn loads and you get a job and you can buy things and do stuff. Well, clearly that doesn't make us happy, does it? So I ask this question, how many of us truly believe in who we are? How many people have got a real sense of purpose, a real sense of belonging, a real sense of things that they really want to do? So anyway, so I was thinking about all this stuff over two to three years, and a year ago, I started this program, as, as uh, Grant mentioned, it's called the ME program, and the three E's stand for enterprise, they stand for employment, um, and, they talk, and, they, and, they, and, sorry, and the third one is empowerment. And the thing is, it's all about us in terms of what we do as individuals. So I started this program, and a year ago we did a, did a series of, of pilot schemes in universities, schools and colleges. We work with kids who are excluded from mainstream education. Just two, three-hour workshops, a couple of times a week. And then we did bigger ones, sort of four, five, six hours. And then we did ones over a few days. Um, we do things like working with kind of strengths tests, we do values cards, we do beliefs, we do timelines, we do lots of little exercises that get us to understand who we are. There's nothing massively technical, there's nothing terribly hard in it all, but it just gets people to think about who they are, what they believe in and what they want to do in life. One of the questions that we ask, and this was a, a workshop we did last summer, was uh, what is, does success mean? And you would think that most people define success as being monetary, wouldn't you? Things that they own. Do you know what 85% of, peop of people who've been through the ME program, and that's roughly about five to 600 people now, actually say that happiness equals success or success equals happiness. But then when you ask the next question is how do you achieve that happiness, people say, I don't know. 
So we use those tools about personal success, timelines, and delve into those wonderful things. This is the, a picture at the end of the, the workshop that we did in the summer. And then at the beginning of this year, I kind of thought that we needed to take this, uh, this idea and see if it would work in some very vulnerable areas in our local communities. So we teamed up with the Job Centre and we've been doing a pilot scheme for the last three months uh, in, in North Wales. And we've taken people who have got uh, anxiety disorders, suffering from depression for many, many years. We've got people who are ex-offenders, people who have obviously have substance issues or used to have. And we kind of thought, could we create workshops to help people understand who they are and what they could become? We created a four-day workshop running consecutively, see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And again, we worked with empowerment, we worked with uh, engagement, we worked with employment, and we worked with enterprise. Series of programs, and as I mentioned, that's uh, recently come to a, a finish. Great thing is that we're now looking to roll this program out over the next year, not just in North Wales, but in Mid Wales and potentially in South Wales too. And one of the questions that we ask on day three, at the beginning of day three, is this, what are you waiting for? And all the people who attend the workshop just sit there and stare at the screen and sort of just scratch their heads. They say, what do you mean, Sid? I said, well, just answer the question. And then they sit there and go, you're right. I'm waiting for me. I'm waiting for permission to give myself the authority or whatever to do something else. As I mentioned, this, the, the workshops are over four days. There's a maximum of 16 hours over those four days, so four hours um, in four days. This is some of the words that people use to describe the program. The amazing thing is they're not actually describing the program, they're actually describing themselves. Because the difference from day one when they come in and people are sat there like this, folded arms, don't want to engage. And on day four they walk, walk in like they're walking on air. It's fantastic, it's amazing. And they're actually describing themselves. And one of the things I've realized that being in the creative business for the last 30 odd years, this is a famous Einstein quote, that imagination is more important than knowledge. And our creativity, the, the knowledge and creativity that we've got in each and every one of us, why don't we use those tools to create something that's truly amazing and do something incredible? Now, the thing is that my view for the future for the ME program, I need about a quarter of a million pounds to build a digital platform so I can support everybody that goes through the program, not just in the four days, but continually for the rest of, of their lives. I want to roll this out not only in Wales, but the whole of the UK. I've been asked if I can do the program now in New York, and this is something that's less than a year old. Um, so I want to roll it out in, uh, in America. I want to roll it out in the rest of the world. I believe that the research that we can gain from the digital platform will help inform communities. It will help inform societies and governments and people like world, world health organizations to understand what people really want and how we really function at a personal level. Now, what I love about this word is that I is in the middle of believe. But what I also love is the fact that there are three E's in the middle of believe as well. So when we talk about the, the ME program, I do believe that it will become a global program. Um, I'm in the process of writing a book and I want to share these tools uh, in a free way um, to the rest of the world to help people understand who they are and how we can benefit society by just doing some very simple things. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.